G'day. G'day. Yes, all right. Everyone's still awake. That's a good start. Um, g'day, everyone. My name is Nick Bowditch. I want to uh, bend your thinking just a little bit today, hopefully, about preconceived ideas about people and maybe preconceived ideas about me. This is me. As you can see, I'm a prolific breeder. <laughs> but <laughs> apart from that, I'm also a successful and unsuccessful entrepreneur and small business person. I have been far more unsuccessful than successful, but I've had a couple of wins along the way. That's in my startup and tech sort of startup journey prior to being recruited back into the workforce where I worked at Facebook in Sydney for about three years. And then a year after that, I worked at Twitter. So it gave me a great understanding of how people communicate, how the world communicates, how people communicate with it, how expectations of communication are managed throughout lots and lots of people at the same time. I now speak for a living and I, I write and I've written books and whatnot and I advise and invest in tech startup mostly in Australia and around the world. So I deal with a lot of people who have either come from a corporate background and into their own startup idea or someone who's just grown up with that fearlessness to be able to go and do their own thing. That's one side of me. This is also me. I am an addict. I have depression and anxiety. Sometimes that depression is so marked that I can't get out of bed for a day or a week, that I can't physically put my legs over the side of the bed and join the day. I have post-traumatic stress disorder from childhood trauma that's now 30 years old. And I take medication every day for that post-traumatic stress disorder. Otherwise, I have nightmares, horrible, harrowing nightmares every night. And you might wonder how both of those people live in the one body. How both of those entities, as human entities, live within the same brain. And the reason I can do that is A, I'm really good at acting, bullshitting my way through things, but B, I've, I've come to accept the things that make me a little bit mad as not as deterrents or things that are going to hold me back, but are things that are actually going to propel me forward. Aristotle hit it on the head, I reckon, when he said, you know, everybody who's in my kind of world, in a creative world or a tech world or a startup world or a world where you back yourself to run your own business or develop your own idea is a little bit mad. Some of us are just a little bit more mad than others. And if you are in my world, if you're in the entrepreneurial tech world, there is a two and a half times more, a greater chance that you will suffer from depression, anxiety, ADHD, OCD, bipolar, substance addiction, or process addiction. Two and a half times more likely. So when someone talks to you about your addiction or about your mental, health, mental illness or whatever it might be, they, the, the sort of industry term that's coined and is used a lot is, these are your defects of your character. All those times when you hurt someone, hurt yourself, let someone down, whatever it might be, they're treated as defects of character. If you think of them in that way, if I think of them in that way, I am never going to go forward. If, you think, if, if any of you think that you have all these defects in what makes you you, you are always going to get held back by that. I choose not to think of them as defects of character. I choose to think of them as gifts that were given to me. And aren't I lucky and special? My mum always said I was special, so it must be true. So I want to talk about a few of those gifts. And if you were ever going to take a photo of me standing in front of a slide and upload it to Instagram and with the hashtag I am wide for wonder, please don't do it right now. <laughs> but the truth is that I am unreliable. The gift of that is that people don't rely on me. I fatigue really easily because of my depression. I just I can't do 20-hour days, on and on and on. 
The gift of that is, I get the rest I need. The very worst concept or word ever introduced into entrepreneurial world and people who are in my business and in my world and industry of starting businesses, starting your own thing, being a startup guy, being a tech guy, running your own thing, whatever. The worst word that we were ever told and continue to be told is hustle. Fuck, if one more person says that to me, they'll see the real value of my mental illness, don't worry. Because the hustle says that you must do 20-hour days for months and months when you're first starting. And if you don't, you are not trying hard enough or you are a failure. You are a failure if you don't put all of your energy into your business and all of that side of your brain and completely ignore all the people in your life who just want you to smile at them, just want you to be there, just want you to pick them up, just want you to sit and listen to their inane story that goes on for 45 minutes and has no ending like all six-year-old stories do. <laughs> and I can give them that because I go to bed and I get the rest I need. If you're busy hustling away, your family is busy packing. I am unpredictable. My wife and my kids don't know which version of me they're going to get every morning when I roll out of bed. I don't know that. The value of that, or the gift of that though, is when you get the very best version of me, it's really, really good. I advise and, and invest in a lot of tech startup. And I don't really, I'm not really encumbered by risk. I'm not risk averse. So, which is great in my industry because when people are coming to me and, with their startup idea, they tend to be really conservative and worried. And I go, don't worry about that. Give us that million bucks that someone invested in you. We're going to build this and this and this and this. And they go, oh, okay. Because they're really conservative in nature, I'm not. That's a gift. That's an absolute gift of my mental illness. I have crazy obsessive thinking. I obsess about the stuff that I obsessed on five minutes ago. I comb over the minutia of the minutia. And as someone who advises businesses in their growth periods, the growth stages, that's really handy. Because I see things that other people don't see. I see... The 60,000 foot view, I've got a really good big picture view and I see the difference between four different hex code of blue on a website. All the middle stuff in between, I'm not really sure how that happens, but I, I'm really good at the fine stuff and the big picture stuff. That's a real gift because everyone else is good at all the, all the other stuff. They miss the stuff that I don't. When I am at my lowest, I can create and write and build the most beautiful, impactful, great storytelling, beautiful things. When my brain is absolutely at its worst, that's when my creativity is absolutely at its best. I've just published a book three months ago, and more than half of that book was written with me in bed or on days where I just could not face the world. And I just, it's a gift to me. I would never have got through that otherwise. I'm good at deadlines. But where a normal person has a deadline here and they'll build sort of incrementally towards it, I'll see the deadline there and I'll do nothing at all <laughs> until about nine minutes before it and then I hit it dead on. And I never miss. The majority of the decks that I do when I'm going to present at a conference in Brisbane or Singapore or whatever, I do on the plane, on the way. But I have never missed one. And that's a gift. I don't feel pressure at all, and I don't feel nerves. I could do this if there were 60,000 people in front of me. It wouldn't change how I feel about it. And if that's not a gift for someone who speaks for a living, then I don't know what is. I have been a terrible father and I've been an even worse husband. How is that a gift? The gift of that is, since I have re-emerged this year after a ton of therapy and rehab and being able to look at how, just how crap I've been in both of those jobs for so long, 
I will never, ever do that again. Every day I commit to myself to be better at two things only, and that is being a husband and a partner to my beautiful and super patient wife and my four feral but delightful little children. (laughs) I'm very, very aware of my vulnerabilities, probably more so than most. I know exactly what's wrong with me. I know exactly how terrible I can be and how terrible I have been. The gift of that is I can accept those things in you a lot easier than most people. I can see the imperfections and the, the, the defects of character, if you will, in you and accept you for them much more than most people because I have been there and I have done that. And I'm very, very aware of that. I, my self-awareness is super in that regard because I understand humans. I know how very, very terrible humans can be. And they have been very, very terrible to me as a child, and I have been very, very terrible to to adults as an adult. I understand just how low you can go. Because of that, I also then understand connection. I understand what it takes to get through to someone. I understand when someone's holding back from me. And people say to me all the time, wow, you seem so comfortable and calm in how open you are about how mad you are. And I think, yeah, I am, because I'm really, really comfortable in it. When you have hidden and kept hidden 30 years of trauma and depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempts and addiction to processes and substance and you hide everything for 30 years and then for one year, which is the last year, you go, actually, fuck it, I'm taking all that off and here I am. There is nothing easier than that, I can tell you. There's nothing brave about telling the truth from my point of view. It's easy. Much, much easier than holding all those secrets ever were. I know the value of connection because every time I lose that connection, I'm in trouble. Every morning I wake up, I know two things. I know, A, that my addiction will try and kill me today. And I know, B, it can't kill me unless I allow it to separate me from the herd. If I allow my addiction to get me on my own and isolated and rejecting everybody else, it will kill me. Straight up. Maybe not today, but it will. I understand the value of connection more than most, which means I also understand the, in- the incredible value of kindness. When you are at your very, very lowest point, the very, very lowest point, and you think... A, I don't want to wake up tomorrow, and B, even if I did, no one would care. At that moment, you don't need somebody being judgmental or being harsh or being angry or giving you some sort of guilt trip or putting shame on you. You just need them to be kind. And the kind thing for me, I bang on about a lot because... It's the easiest and the cheapest thing we can possibly do to give someone else. It's so easy. And we just don't do it enough. So here's my gifts to you. I've, given you, I've told you all the gifts of what goes on in for me. This is the two things that I think are worth thinking about and worth remembering. For me, I don't care what you wear. I don't care what it says in your LinkedIn profile. I don't care what you do for a living or what your role is or what your social status is. I don't care how much money's in your bank. I don't care how much weed you smoke. I don't care about any of those things because I only care about what you do. Some of the best people, some of the best human beings I have ever met, I met in rehab, and in fellowship meetings since rehab. People who are, who are not broken, they're just a little bit bent, just like me. But they don't care what you are either. 
They only care about what you do. Deeds, not words. And I think something we can all concentrate on, something we can all do better, is not only valuing kindness, but actually dishing some out. If you know somebody who has a mental illness, you might be related to them, you might be them. You might know them through your sporting club, you might know them through work, you might whatever. I would encourage you to speak to them about it. The problem with mental illness is the same problem we have with communication, the illusion that it happened. It, you know, if you don't talk about it, people will never open up. If they never open up, they're going to cage it down forever. And that is a really terrible place to be. Kindness wins. In every single situation in our life, you will never do anything better than just be kind to someone. In a business sense, you will never lose business by being kind. You're only going to gain it. And in a personal sense, you're never going to repel somebody because you're being too kind. Nobody's going to say, oh, geez, that Johnny, geez, he's a pain in the ass. He's so kind all the time. I can't take it anymore. It's the, it's the cheapest and the most effective way to connect humans. And it will always win over everything else, regardless of what's going on in our world right now. Kindness wins. Kindness will always win. Thank you very much for your attention today.